We're going to do the travels with old two gun panel. We'll talk about uh, some research methodologies, places to go and see, things to do, that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad, Bob, uh, and I'm Rob Ream. We'll do the second half. Uh, we'll begin with Todd Vick. Take it away, Todd. Okay. Can everybody hear me? I am going to actually take you to Bagwell, Texas and to Lincoln, New Mexico. And we will uh, start at Bagwell. Is anybody familiar with Bagwell, Texas? You know that in the history of Howard. Let me see a show of hands. Okay, so there's not very many hands. Uh, the Howards lived in Bagwell when he was about age seven, eight. He started school in Bagwell. And while they were there, there was a former slave named Mary Bohannon who actually would cook and clean and do odd assorted jobs for some of the families in the town. And apparently the Howards knew her well enough because Robert would sit at her feet or listen to stories from her about her former life as a slave and some ghost stories. So he actually was able to get a lot of information from her and she played a very important role in his life. Uh, Mary Bohannon died February the 23rd, 1921. She's buried in an unmarked grave in what is known as Bagwell Cemetery. How many of you have heard of Mary Bohannon? Okay, more hands went up there, okay. Um, let me move to the next one here. Her importance is because of her ghost stories. Those stories inspired a number of Howard's works, Black Canaan being one of the more popular ones. Uh, elements of Kelly the Conjure Man, Pigeons from Hell is essentially from Mary Bohannon. Now, Howard took the story, changed a little bit of the plot, a little bit of the scene, characters, and things like that, but he owes that story to her. Um, it, this also <coughs> allowed Howard to experience a culture that he wouldn't have been able to experience otherwise, former slaves, African-American culture. So she did play a very pivotal role. What I was doing with this is I'm researching for a biography currently, and I was looking online, Rob was helping me with some information. I went to the Red River County Courthouse and was digging up information. And as I was uh, researching all this information, I ran into Lawrence and Sue Dell online at their Find a Grave site. They actually discovered Bagwell Cemetery and they've marked it. You can go to Find a Grave and put Mary Bohannon's name in there and it'll come up and they have a map where it's marked. Uh, so what I did is I got some information from them, found out where it was, and they told me who owned the land that it was on. And in Texas, you do not cross anybody's fence and go on their land, we will shoot you dead. So you had to be very careful about that, so I had to get permission. But they did not have the Miller's contact information, so I had to actually track that down. I finally got it. Fortunately, they had a landline, so it showed up on a Google search. Um, so I got the information I called, I spoke with Miss Miller, she was aware of the grave site, apparently some other people had called, maybe, have you called them and asked? No. Okay. But she was aware of it, so she knew it was on her land. Uh, she explained where it was, how I could get there, she did give me permission, she said she wasn't going to show up. She would be, she told me, I'm going to be surprised if you can even get from the gate to the grave site. And you'll see why here with these pictures. The, the thicket that I had to crawl through was immense. But anyway, uh, they gave me permission. We went down to there. I asked my wife initially to go with me. She's a public school teacher, and at the time I was going, they were doing the standardized testing statewide then, so she couldn't go. So what I did, the next best thing, is drag my closest friend along, David Piskey. He swore that if we got killed on this land, he was going to kill me. But he went anyway. This is the, uh, the map that Lawrence and Sue Dell uh, have on the, the uh, find a grave. This is a closer view of that map. If you notice at the top right hand corner, that's a, uh, a stable, that little white spot there at the top right. The little red flag is where the gravesite is. From that point to the gravesite is a, just under a mile. It took us 45 minutes to get from the stable down to the gravesite. 
So let me move on here to the next. So I've got a, I have a picture here on the property itself. I took this picture, one, to mark our spot for those trees to make sure that if we're that far away and we can't see above the thicket, we can at least see the tops of the trees. This is basically what they look like. It gives you a perspective of what's behind us. When you turn around, this is at eye level. We have to wade through this. So we're chopping and breaking stuff and making our way to it. But we reach a, uh, we reach a clearing, and I wanted to take a picture of the perspective of the clearing. That's, of course, David sitting there. They had cleared this out, fortunately for us, because had they not, it probably would have taken us about an hour and a half. But they cleared it out. You could see some of the tree stumps. From that picture turning around is the tree line. Now we have to find the grave site in this area, and there's the tree line. When we get up there, we find a, uh, a deer stand. And, well, actually, while we were out there, there was gunfire going off, so <laughs> it, that was kind of interesting. <clears throat> uh, but we, I climb up on this deer stand to see if I can kind of see through the tree lines and get a better perspective of, of the grave site. And I took a picture to the right from the deer stand. Do you see the grave site? Well, neither did we. So um, you can barely see one of the headstones at the base of the tree line. Uh, you can't hardly see it from there. But anyway, I took, well, while we're discussing the tree line, let me go ahead and, dis I mean, the, the cemetery, let me go ahead and discuss some of the things that are, uh, some of the facts about the cemetery itself. It has 33 burial sites as of December 31st, 2004, according to the Dells. They're the ones who've done all the research on this particular site. Every single grave that's there is either a child of a former slave or a former slave. The oldest marked grave is Paul Needham Pruitts. He died March 23rd in 1895. When I was there, I counted at least five or so unmarked graves. Uh, two, or two or three of those had some old rusty funeral home markers on them. The last burial that's recorded is November 28, 1963, which is just over 50 years ago. I'm not sure why this was actually abandoned. I tried to pull up some information as to why just 50 some odd years ago this was just neglected. And the only thing I can think of is because it was former slaves, someone else owned the land and there was probably no living relatives. It just got neglected and nobody, nobody uh, cared for it. To the left-hand side from the deer stand, there's a road back there at the very back. So what we do is we take that road in the opposite direction of the cemetery because that's what smart people do. They go away from what they're looking for, but we didn't know. So, um, Fortunately, along this road, we actually saw I thought it was the back side of the cemetery, but the more I think about it, this is probably the front side because that road had probably been there for a long, long time. But we saw one of the first headstones. And of course you can see how thick the leaves and the tree line is, so we decided to go ahead and uh, start walking into the, uh, the trees at that point toward the graves, toward the cemetery, which is kind of starting to sound like a bad horror story. They wandered into the forest. Uh, some of the various headstones that I took pictures of while we were there, some of these you couldn't even see, but you see how thick the trees are around them. There's a few more. This one you could actually read, Rachel Brewster's. She was born November 28, 1814. It looks like she died in 1896. And then here's a few more. You can see the one on the left there has quite a bit of wear over the years. That's a footstone in the middle. There's one of the old uh, rusted funeral home markers that we saw. This would be an unmarked grave. Here's uh, two unmarked graves side by side. You can kind of see the indention in the ground that would be about the size of a casket or a burial site. And they're side by side. So. There's two more here. It was harder to get a, a perspective of the grave sites from, from this angle, but in any of those I just showed you could be Mary Bohannon in any of those particular graves. But this was quite intriguing because uh, nobody had actually ever been out here in Howard's study, so I kind of wanted to go out there and get some pictures and get a, 
get a feel for what this area was like and what it would have been like when Howard was alive, that, that type of thing. So that is Bagwell Cemetery. Let's move on to Lincoln, New Mexico. Uh, Howard and Truett Vinson traveled to Santa Fe back in June of 1935, and uh, he was always fascinated with Billy the Kid and the Lincoln County Wars, and in June of 35, when they showed up, Lincoln County, 55 years later, would have pretty much looked about the same as it did during the Lincoln County Wars. There are a few changes that I'll point out in some of these pictures, but basically, it would have looked just like it was at that time. When they showed up, Howard had one building in mind that he wanted to see because he'd read so much material about it, uh, and that was the old Murphy House. But if you're interested in actually reading his account, there are quite a number of letters that he describes the Lincoln County Wars and Billy the Kid and this whole situation to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Is anybody here familiar with the Lincoln County Wars? Okay, in a nutshell, you have two cattlemen uh, that are in Lincoln County. You have Murphy and his faction with Sheriff Brady and the quote unquote law, which was basically corrupt at that time. They're trying to take over the entire county as far as the cattle drives, the cattle industry, and they're trying to push out a guy named Tunstall. And Tunstall is Billy the Kid, the regulators, that faction. They end up killing Tunstall and that's what pretty much inaugurates the war between the two. That's basically it in a nutshell. There's so many more details, but that kind of gives you an idea. I wanted to visit Lincoln for two reasons. First, to see the town, because I, for 30 some odd years, on and off, I'd been researching the Lincoln County War and Billy, Billy the Kid. And second, to confirm a picture that Robert Howard is in, in front of the old Murphy house, that was long since assumed to be Raymond Mayes. And that's this picture right here. Everybody's probably seen that. Now, on the old Murphy house right there, you see the stairwell out in front? That would not have been there during Billy the Kid's day. That was added in 1900. But I wanted to find out if that, in fact, was really Raymond Mayes, so that's one of the reasons why I went. And this is why it's always been assumed that that was Raymond Mayes, because he's mentioned. He was the owner of the La Paloma, which we'll see pictures of here in a minute. Uh, he was the grandson of Montoya, who was Murphy Sharpshooter, so he was heavily involved in the Lincoln County Wars. And there's the La Paloma. Now, the Mayes family actually gave me this picture. It's at the Lincoln Historical Society. You can see kind of the wording that was written on there. This picture would have been exactly what it looked like right around the time Howard and Vincent showed up. You can kind of see there's three guys sitting on the porch up there. Here's a map of Lincoln. Has anybody ever been to Lincoln? A couple of you. Yep. You can go from the farthest east side of Lincoln to the farthest west side of Lincoln and just stroll, walk. It takes about 30 minutes if you don't stop and look at the buildings. It's not really that big of a town. But that kind of gives you a perspective of what it looks like. The first place we stopped at was the Anderson Freeman Visitor Center and Museum. I spoke with a ranger there, and I started asking about Raymond Mayes. He looked at me really strange. He knew the Mayes name. He didn't know who Raymond was, which I'll explain a little later. But he sent me down to the Lincoln County Historical Society, which was next to the Tunstall store, to get some information on the Mayes family. So I went down there, and it was closed. The whole day it was closed. So I thought, well, I just struck out. So I figured while we were down there, I might as well go ahead and visit the Tunstall store. When we walked into the, well, this is the, the front of it, the front of that Tunstall store. The trees wouldn't have been there. The benches wouldn't have been there at the time of uh, Billy the Kid. But basically, that's what it would have looked like. When you walk in, this is a, a three-picture perspective of exactly how it would have been set up. The lady at the door was explaining everything to me, how the... Fixtures are basically the same. They didn't take those or pull them out. The floor is different, of course. But straight down the middle of the Tunstall store is his living quarters. If you notice, on the right-hand side of the bed, you see a hole in the floor. During the Lincoln County Wars, when Billy the Kid and several regulators killed Sheriff Brady, they ran into the Tunstall store and they hid Billy the Kid underneath those boards. And he stayed in there. And it kind of gives you an explanation of 
of the whole situation behind behind that. Tunstall is buried behind the store, and it, when you tour the place, most people won't tell you that, but fortunately the, the rangers uh, told us where to go find the, the, his gravesite. But when we were walking out of the store, I ran into the park ranger again who came down looking for me because he realized that the Historical Society building was closed. He gave me a piece of paper and said, go home, contact this person. This is a Facebook page. It's private. They're waiting for you to join. All the family members who were involved with the people who were in the, the um, Lincoln County Wars, they're on this page. You'll probably find the Mayas family and they'll be able to answer the questions you're asking me. So I was like, yes. Even though this place was closed, I still got the information. So after that, we, after talking to the ranger, we wanted to head into the La Paloma. This is what it looks like today. I was ex pretty disappointed with the La Paloma at that time. When we walked in, there was a lady who owned it. She was selling all these various little trinkets and jewelry. She had jewelry set up on the bar. I walked in all excited to get information. She immediately came up to me and I started asking historical questions. And you could just tell. Uh, she didn't want to take the time to answer, but she did tell me that the floor was original and the bar was original, and then she walked off. So I got a picture of the floor and the bar. So that would have been the actual bar that Billy the Kid and the Regulators sat at while they were drinking their beers and getting drunk. And across the street would have been Murphy, which makes no sense to me to get drunk in front of your enemies, but apparently they did. So when we got out of the La Paloma, I went straight over to the Murphy house. Now this is where that picture is of Mr. Mayes and Robert Howard. And so naturally, I wanted to get a picture of me standing in the same spot. So we go in to the, uh, the courthouse. There's a ranger in there. He gives us a private tour of the, the bottom floor. He gives us some really good information, tells us a lot of history, and then sets us loose to go upstairs and look at a few things. So I got to wander around. I don't have enough time here for pictures, but if you, <clears throat> if you ever go to Lincoln, this is well worth actually checking out. After we left Lincoln, New Mexico, I got in touch with the Mayas family on the Facebook page. We exchanged emails, and from emails we exchanged phone phone contacts, I contacted them and started asking questions about Raymond Mayus, and they quickly corrected me. It's not Raymond, it's Roman. And so Howard had gotten the name wrong, which was common. It was probably the accent that Roman was using and he mistook it for Raymond. But anyway, I got in touch with Roman's daughter who was about eight years old when, when Robert Howard showed up. And then I got in touch with Robert May, uh, Roberta Mayus Baker, who is Roman's granddaughter, that I showed them the picture and they said, yes, that's Roman Mayus. So I got the confirmation that that was actually him. So now we don't have to assume it any longer. It actually is him. Uh, they were both very excited. They had no idea that their father and grandfather had met Robert E. Howard when they found out that he was the author of Conan. And I asked them questions, historical questions about the La Paloma, if they sold postcards there at the time that he would have showed up, and they did. He said that, uh, she told me that Roman did sell postcards, and the reason I wanted to find that out is because when they got to Santa Fe, Robert Howard sent this postcard to August Derleth, and that would have been bought from Roman Mayes in the La Paloma. And on the postcard, it says this card was purchased in Lincoln, New Mexico from a descendant of a participant in the bloody Lincoln County Wars, which would have been Montoya's grandson. So I thought that was pretty cool. When we came out of the old Murphy courthouse, we ran into the Gato gang. <laughs> this was a group of feral cats. There was about 20 of them, and when I approached, these were the ones that stayed put. The one in the front hissed at me, pretty much telling me they I was not welcomed in their territory. So that's the Gato gang, but anyway, any questions about Lincoln or, or Bagwell?